Hi, this is Harold in China. I'm back in Shanghai. I've been to Beijing over the weekend and it's uh, good news that traveling between Beijing and Shanghai is now really easy again. Uh, you need the COVID tests like for any public places, but both airplane, I flew to Beijing and then it took the high speed rail back to Shanghai. The rail takes about four and a half hours and um, the flight takes about two hours maybe. But because you have to wait before the flight, uh, it's, it's actually not that much faster. It's just that there are flights later in the evening. I went after work, there was no more trains, so I took a flight. And then on Sunday afternoon, I took the train back to Shanghai, where I am now again. Today, I, I want to talk about uh, the Taiwan issue again. I want to take a slightly bigger picture. Uh, first, I want to start with this excellent uh, short clip that um, the, a good friend, uh, Fernando, did. I'm going to link to his YouTube channel, Excellent Channel, by the way. And that's one of the purposes of our trip, to show the world the success of the people of Taiwan. Their courage, their courage to change their own country to become more democratic. The United States recognizes the government of the People's Republic of China as a sole legal government of China. There is but one China and Taiwan is part of China. Their courage to change their own country. There is but one China, and Taiwan is part of China. So you see, that was Jimmy Carter saying Taiwan clearly is a part of China. He said that less than 45 years ago. Now an American highest level politician, Speaker of the House, third in line to the president, says uh, Taiwan is a country. That's how short-lived promises and contracts by the U.S. really are. And countries really should note when dealing with the U.S. that their promises don't last. And people should just be aware of that. And I'm sure a lot of Taiwanese people are aware of what's happening uh, when you're friends with the U.S. Uh, Another good friend of the U.S., obviously Ukraine, is seeing now what it means when the U.S. says they stand by, stand with. Yeah, they stand with Ukraine. Uh, it just doesn't help Ukraine. Uh, the people of Ukraine are dying and the Americans are enjoying huge weapon sales. And um, so when we look at the Taiwan issue, Pelosi was there. I've uh, had the opportunity to publish an opinion piece and what I'm saying is Pelosi got a photo op and uh, for like half a day the US was cheering and celebrating was like yeah we stick it to Xi Jinping uh, we, we do what we want we can still send our people uh, to China against the will of China because we have this access to the island of Taiwan um, of course uh, the media worded differently. They claim Taiwan is a country. Uh, the government of the US still stops short of doing so uh, because they know this would lead to war. This is the red line that China has communicated very clearly. Um, but even that understanding is now uh, breaking apart within the US government. And it's, it's a weird thing how um, most public discussion that I see, I mean, some Americans are warning, are saying it's a bad idea to provoke China now into a war as well. Um, but most discussions, they only focus on the question of what will China do? Does it have nukes? And obviously then the immediate response is we shouldn't let those communists dictate to us what we do. And they never even mention the fact that the US has promised and written signed contracts of recognizing Taiwan as part of China uh, governed from Beijing. So nobody cares in the US about US promises. And I find that quite amazing, especially in a country where the foreign minister, Anthony Blinken, keeps talking about rules-based order. In my understanding, maybe that's a European thing, part of rules is what the Romans called Pacta Sunt Servanda, meaning the contracts must be kept. And in, in, in ancient Rome, this meant even if you went to war with, a, with another state, if you had a contract with that state, you still keep that contract while the contract's ongoing. 
while on the other hand your armies are fighting and the US don't care. Rules-based order seems to mean the US makes the rules, the others have to follow. So that's the difference to international law because obviously law, the definition is it's the same for everyone. So if you have international law, it also means the powerful have to oblige, uh, have to follow that law. So yeah, that's the concept of, of, of laws, of uh, both national laws, the government has to follow the national law, international law, the countries have to follow those laws, no matter how powerful they are. And so the alternative is you would declare a rules-based order. There's no official definition what the rule is, who makes a rule, for whom it counts, and who enforces it. And so if the US doesn't even follow its own contracts and promises, then yeah, you can guess what rules-based order really means. So now um, they got this photo up. Pelosi uh, went there, she landed, she had some pictures with various politicians in Taiwan. And what did she gain? What did Taiwan gain? I mean, there's these declarations, oh, it's a show of solidarity, it's a, it's a show that the US is standing with Taiwan. But is it? Because what China did in response was saying, you threw the gauntlet down at us, trying to provoke us to shoot down your uh, 82-year-old uh, Miss Pelosi. We didn't shoot her down, but now we throw the gauntlet back at you. We do a military blockade all around Taiwan into what would be territorial waters if Taiwan was a country. And now show us if you're going to shoot. Uh, obviously, the US did not interfere. So what's this statement of we, we stand with Taiwan worth if you're not going to do anything if uh, Taiwan gets attacked? But even more important than this short-term show of force is the precedent. China now has a precedent where it showed uh, Taiwan does not have territorial waters. Taiwan doesn't have a military sovereignty. The Chinese People's Liberation Army is able and has precedent of training with live fire within uh, a few miles off the shore of Taiwan. It has precedent of shooting uh, missiles across the island of Taiwan. And they can do that again and they will do that again. And from doing that again, they can you know, blockade Taiwan. It's an island. It doesn't have much resources. So obviously it will be uh, hit very hard by a, by a naval blockade. Um, but also such exercises, as we have learned from, from uh, Ukraine, can be used as a launching pad for, for an invasion. Before, the, the strategic situation was the mainland. It's very close to the Taiwanese island. There's only this Taiwan Strait um, and that has to be crossed. And so the whole defense has to prevent the People's Liberation Army from crossing that strait. Well, now that strategic disposition shifts because the PLA can do exercises where they also are on the east side of Taiwan. They can launch an attack from any side or from all sides at the same time. And that is uh, significantly more difficult to defend against, obviously. There's another response that China did. Um, they, they sanctioned Pelosi's family. I think that move is probably even popular within the US. Um, the level of corruption. Some people are saying currently Pelosi only went to Taiwan to distract from the fact that her husband uh, got uh, pulled over or even had an accident, I think, while driving very, very drunk. And in his first response, he showed a donor card, kind of trying to show the police how much money he's giving to them. So it was uh, imagining that, uh, or, or it's said, some people are saying maybe he tried to bribe the police to let him go. <laughs> Anyways, um, he was very drunk. He's her husband. In other times, uh, this would have been a big scandal one of the top politicians in the country, uh, in the US, has her, her spouse uh, being pulled over drunk, having an accident drunk driving. 
nowadays nobody cares in the US anymore, especially not if it's a leading Democrat because uh, Trump evil, so they cannot have a scandal on the on the Democratic uh, Party right now. Um, so yeah, they sanction her. Then another uh, uh, um, response is they end dialogues. Um, and one is very dangerous, the military dialogue. So US and China military matters always had an open phone line so that the militaries could coordinate each other, like coordinate if, if there's any tensions, if something happens, they can call directly without going through other diplomatic channels. That is suspended. I'm sure that will open again. I mean, the Chinese, they're threatening, but they're not reckless. And um, they too will say, it's better to talk before we send nukes. So I'm sure that will open again. I'm not even sure if it's really, really close. Like I, I wouldn't be surprised if some general, some high level military still have a, a connection that they're maintaining, maybe just not officially. And I'm thinking of an instance where Donald Trump um, was president and was doing all kinds of threats. And um, it later came out that a, a US general, I think it was a very high level military from the US, secretly told the Chinese military that he would warn them if Trump orders nuclear strikes. So he would um, prevent those strikes. And he tried to kind of calm the mood in China which um, some Trumpians thought very shocking. I think most of the rest of the world thought that was actually a good thing that that happened. But um, I, it just gives me the feeling that these um, informal channels probably still exist. And then there's another dialogue which I find very interesting that it's now suspended or stopped by China, which is the discussion on climate change. And it's interesting for a number of reasons. For one, uh, it's the one topic that Anthony Blinken, uh, Joe Biden, that they always emphasize, oh, we want to cooperate about climate change and, and you know, compete on other topics. There are enemies, but on climate change, they still should do what we want. And <laughs> I feel like their definition of cooperation isn't let's have honest talks and let's exchange views and let's think about how we can uh, better the situation. Also, from what I heard through like think tank circles in China, that the so-called cooperation on climate change is fake. It's not happening. There's no coordination. It's just uh, US blustering, claiming that they're still partnering with China on some topics. And so China is now saying, well, we don't need the US. It might be spun by the media as China stops working against climate change. And I think that's definitely wrong. So I want to make that point. China isn't saying we don't fight against climate change anymore. China is saying we don't need the US to fight against climate change. And in a way also saying if like once we have successes reducing our CO2 emissions, we don't want to share that success with the US because they're just, you know, they're all words, they're all talks, <laughs> NATO, right? No action, talk only. Um, so China just says, well, we'll just continue our way uh, fighting against climate change. And we don't need to talk about this with the US anymore. We don't want to share our success with the Americans. And it um, will be interesting how and if the US even respond to that. Climate change was high on the agenda of Biden at one point. Right now, I don't know who even makes the agenda and I don't know where it is. Uh, I do think it's also very high on the agenda, for example, of the German government at the moment. So I do assume, I kind of predict that Western media are going to spin this and saying uh, China is, is acting recklessly and doesn't hold up its responsibility for the climate and kind of blame China for not doing anything. But as I said, I think that's wrong. China will continue to fight against climate change, probably more effectively than most Western countries. They just don't want to talk about it with the US at the moment. All right, that's uh, what I had to share today. I'm going to share my uh, opinion piece also in the description, as well as a link to uh, Fernand's uh, excellent channel. Have a good one. Bye bye.